All right, so beyond that, There's an additional part and the, the value of this depends on a number of things one is how much localization do you want to do and another is where exactly is the display which I need to I guess I am going to talk about displays as the fourth component let me just mention it a bit here is the speaker inside of your ear canal or is the speaker out here somewhere right, another question is is it a closed system like do I put a um, um a close kind of closed headphone or earphone on you. So, it blocks out the outside sound and you only get what comes from the speaker or does the speaker just add to the outside sound coming in. So, there is different kinds of choices, but it let us suppose that the stimulus is getting very close um right up against your tympanic membrane right. So, if that is the case I am not touching, but very very close to your tympanic membrane. Well, we have to account then for some additional um scattering of sound waves. So, problem becomes account for a uh, scattering of sound waves due to um the outer ears. that part which I called the pinna and the and the canal as well that goes into your inner ear. Um what about the shape of your head? Um your whole body it could even be scattering of sound based on what clothes I am wearing today right and maybe it is different from day to day based on wh what I am wearing could be different based on whether or not I am wearing a hat right. So, the sound will propagate differently that ultimately comes into your ears you have to simulate the rest of that right. Remember when we talked about how close is the stimulus generator to the sense. So, if you make it very close you end up having to simulate the rest that is that is around it right because on the back side of it you end up having to simulate it. Um <clears throat> so, how do you do that how do you deal with that well people have studied this very carefully and <clears throat> they have come up with with what is called an H R T F well sounds very similar to the B R D F when we talk about reflectance models um has a similar kind of function, but not exactly the same um it is head related transfer function And this is actually this extra amount of information, the scattering that is due to your outer ear, the pinna, the head, and your whole body. This is the extra information that we use in order to resolve um the source of sound inside of this cone of confusion that I talked about last time. So, it is this extra amount of scattering, there is a transformation that is happening based on where the sound is coming from, and it is a transformation in the frequency domain. So, the way this function is represented h of f this is a function of frequency and it looks like this there is output as a function of frequency over input as a function of frequency. So, this is a um um corresponds to a linear filter. So, if you have signal processing background or electrical engineering kind of background then this is just a, a, a simple well let us say complex example of a linear filter. <coughs> it depends on individual ears. So, each one of us will have a different HRTF. So, if I were to if you were to uh, take off your pinna and swap it with one of your friends then you may have for at least some short amount of time a, a lessened ability to localize sounds especially inside of the cone of confusion. However, our brains due to uh, um, the, the kind of plasticity and adaptability that we have we may be able to adapt because if you all of a sudden put on suppose I put on some big um Texas cowboy hat um that will definitely affect the scattering of sound as it comes into the ears, but you can adjust to that and after maybe who knows how long I will just make up a time after 20 minutes of wearing the big Texas cowboy hat 
you may be able to then localize sounds just as effectively as you could when the hat were off. So, so there are very interesting questions here about um, if I want to simulate the scattering of sounds do you have to learn a particular HRTF that corresponds to your body or at least as close as possible or can you deal with just some generic one and will your brain adapt to it. I think there are a lot of open questions in here and experts in um, um, audio rendering are studying these um, in over the last few years. So, it is um, very current area of research. Certainly, people in industry would like to know do you need to have customized HRTFs per person or maybe you just need three different generic ones and you just select the one that seems to be the best and it is good enough or maybe it does not matter very much as long as there is at least one reasonable representative HRTF that covers most cases and then your brain will just adapt to that after using it for a short amount of time. So, these are the kinds of questions that exist for this. Um, let me show you how these are um, measured in a in a studio. So, you have um, you have the human head I will put some ears here let us suppose it is looking upward we are just have a top down view and um, we place the subject in what is called an anechoic chamber. That means that the walls all around the subject are fully absorbing the sound right. So, there is no echo back. So, it is absorption for the materials all around <coughs> and then inside of this chamber you place um, speakers you have the ability to place a speaker that generates a sound source and you put it at different locations perhaps um, every 15 degrees you put the speaker and then you generate an impulse just a single impulse and you look at the impulse response. So, this is a standard way of designing uh, filters. So, you look at the impulse response from that particular location and you record it across the um, the frequency spectrum and then you move to another location and you do the same. <coughs> you can do this at various angles both in uh, you know across the um, um, the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. You can also look at different distances or you can just make a simplifying assumption that these sounds are coming from sufficiently far away that I am not going to worry about distance. So, um, so it could be that we measure this HRTF function of frequency we look at these two angles horizontal and vertical and some distance d. So, as I said we could put these speakers further and further away or we use a far field approximation. This is like the assumption of parallel wave fronts for light which it does correspond to this case in which case it just simplifies down to only taking measurements based on um, um, we are we're, we're characterizing this transfer function here in terms of frequency, but it only depends on beyond that uh, theta and phi. Right. <coughs> All right and um, where I have drawn the center here hmm, this makes me wonder um, I put it at the center of the head um, it may make more sense to study the HRTF for each particular ear and just move this over. So, I could take this picture and center it on the ear and then move all the way around at a fixed distance from the ear. In fact, that might make more sense than this um, I have drawn it based on the center of the head I could do it once for the right ear and once for the left ear right. pretty sure our, our the pinna for each ear is not exactly the same for ear to ear from left and right for an individual person all right. So, <coughs> it is still going to be you know different based on whether the person is sitting in a chair or standing up and again if you were to put a hat on you will get a different result, but that is the idea you generate these perfect uh, impulse signals from a speaker placed at different locations you gather all that information and you can reconstruct this um, HRTF function of frequency, but also function of the angle that the sound is coming from two angles that it is coming from and distance in the more general case. All right. So, you take that into account and then you apply that as a kind of distortion at the end. So, when you have figured out how you are going to render the audio signal at the end of that you can apply this filter as a kind of 
distortion. Just as we have optical distortions in the video rendering case, we have this audio distortion that we apply to take into account the um, the additional scattering of sound before it goes into our the inside of our ear, the inner ear part. All right, let me um, get to the last part, which is the last part of <clears throat> the four points that I'm making here. And just simply mention the display choices. So, display. We essentially have one pixel per ear, right? We're just generating a, a, a sound pressure wave per ear. Um, it's interesting when I compare again I'm always trying to do, compare to a uh, visual. Um, so, for visual displays we worry a lot about the spatial resolution, but as I said we do not have an imaging system here do we right. So, it is just a matter of generating what looks like a single scalar kind of pressure wave right. It does not have some kind of spatial resolution. However, note that the time resolution is much more important. Remember when we talked about frames per second and we got up to uh, 75, 90 hertz maybe even got as high as 1000 hertz when I talked about this problem of if you take a blinking LED and you are not tracking it you may perceive it as separate pulses hitting the retina separate images on the retina. So, um, so we did get up that high, but in general for audio the frames per second even though it appears to be sort of like one pixel for um, uh, per ear the temporal resolution is significantly higher right. So, we normally deal with 60 frames a second on a standard display here we have um, time more um, time resolution being more important or crucial right. So, you have up to well we go from let us say 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So, that is just something to think about right it is the temporal resolution that ends up being crucial for audio not some kind of spatial arrangement which we do not have because we do not have an optical system. And then if we think about the choices that we have, we have a surround sound which I gave an example of that in the first lecture. We could have a surround sound system that is fixed in space. Hmm. I suppose I could mix things right I could have a head mounted display for the visual part, but I could still have audio being surrounding in the room right. So, it could be half cave like and half head mounted display like right we could do that we could separate them out. Um, <coughs> that is probably not too convenient, but this is um, what we would have in a cave system or if we wanted to do that for a head mounted display we could put it uh, surrounding. So, in this case surround sound this, the display or the speakers are fixed in space right. Versus I could be wearing um, what we normally refer to as headphones course, they are only for the ear is what I am talking about. I was calling them um, earphones and in this particular case um, we have speakers that are placed on the outside of the ear. There is an interesting question of does that compress your pinna when you put them on right and um, very often for closed headphones what are called closed headphones you are just compressing the pinna blocking off all of the outside sound and then generating a sound for your ear. So, this part gets um, the, the, the part that ends up being important here um, this this extra scattering may get lost. So, do you try to compensate for that with an HRTF you may have to right uh, versus open headphones which may leave more room for the sound to propagate in through the pinna and um, also combined with outside sounds right. So, open headset open headphones um, this means that the sound from outside of the headphones is being added. Now, if you are not in a quiet place and you want to use your virtual reality system then you have to deal with the sound from the outside. It is just like the difference here between um, having a head mounted display that was mainly designed for virtual reality which blocks out the outside light like the um, Oculus Rift the DK2 is like that or take something such as um, Microsoft HoloLens 
it is designed for augmented reality in which case it is combining the light from the outside with the light that it is generating. So, same two choices exist for um standard uh stereo headphones that you can buy. And then you know presenting the stimulation as close as possible um you could put earbuds into your ear canal this is eliminating the pinna altogether. So, eliminate pinna and the outer ear canal all together right. So, or at least some portion of the outer ear canal and uh, in this case um you had better account for the scattering of sound using the HRTF if you want to have highly local highly um accurate localization ability right because you have eliminated all of that by bypassing the pinna altogether by using earbuds. So, yes. Uh, that is a good question I guess it depends on whether the earbuds themselves are more closed or open right. So, that is a good question. So, you have the earbud it is blocking sound coming in directly maybe there is still some vibration from the pinna could be the case I am thinking of the effect of the pin as mainly being reverberation of sound as it goes into the canal while it is still going through the air, but you could also think about mechanical vibration right through the the pinna itself that may transmit some sound. I am not I am certainly not an audio expert, so I do not I do not know, but it, it, there could be still some effect from that um and I am thinking of the earbuds as being closed as I said, so that it is blocking vibrations coming through the ear canal, but the whole earbud could be vibrating I suppose and transmitting some sound from the outside um you know how quiet does it sound when you put earbuds in and there is and and there is um there is sound coming in from the outside it does block a fraction of it, but you still do hear sounds from the outside right. So, I guess there is still some combination, but that is not the virtual part that you wanted right. So, you will be able to localize. So, if there is some sound seeping through from the physical world you may be able to localize that, but it is not the sounds from the virtual environment that you care about right. So, it is a good question it is good to think about. So, let me finish this topic of audio by mentioning challenges for developers. <coughs> um let me just erase actually I was going to draw it there, but let me erase here. So, what are the problems for developers in this space? Um so, audio rendering for virtual reality is not as far developed as it is for graphical rendering you know for the visual part we leverage all of the techniques from computer graphics many of them are useful many of them do not work well in VR we talked about that in previous lectures in in the audio space we have a lot less work that has been done in terms of audio rendering it has been considered much less important and I think now that we have the ability to do head tracking and combine audio and visual senses in virtual reality it is now getting gaining a lot of momentum and a lot of interest. So, what are the problems or challenges? for developers well one is how much modeling uh detail or accuracy is needed right. So, how much do we have to worry about that right can we make very very coarse crude simplified models and that will be sufficient or do we really have to pay attention to every bit of detail right. Do I have to worry about the fabric in all of your clothing if I want to model the acoustics of my lecture today right. So, I, I do not know how much um if, if and if so how to accomplish this um what we would like to have is good middleware to facilitate this right. We have geometric modeling tools we have game engines we have all kinds of things out there for the visual part we need good tools for the audio part it is going to take many years to develop these to make it easier for um the developers of virtual reality content right. So, right now they have to be they are sort of in the um in the early ages of this right where you have to do all the work yourself all the hard work yourself. So, the person the developer is trying to be creative has to get into a lot of the technical details and do the implementations themselves whereas if it is the visual part you could go to something like unity or unreal engine and um very quickly make beautiful visual content without worrying about the technical implementation aspects in in most cases. Um another challenge is how to evaluate um correctness 
or sufficiency for your task right. Have you accomplished your goal or not? If it is visual you may look at it and say it looks fine right. If it is um audio again do you are you do you care about the fact that you might have lost some localization capability and if you if it is important for your task to have that localization capability um how do you know that you have maintained it right. How do you know that you have reproduced the sounds well enough to maintain that. So, the ears are not as sensitive as the eyes in some ways and um you know these HRTFs is it important to get those correct or does your brain just adapt to a different HRTF or if you eliminate it altogether, how much of your localization capability have you lost and is it critical for your application. Um so, this gets very difficult and generally you have a problem that I would call a um one of psychophysics. When we talked about the perception of sound you have to design experiments to determine um whether or not you have succeeded. So, it may become much more complicated you may have to design experiments on and um bring in uh, human subjects to evaluate whether or not you have gotten it um correct um for or sufficient for your task in terms of the simulation you are performing and generally. you know what are the computational costs associated with doing these audio simulations can you take shortcuts and still be effective with regard to uh, number 2 are you getting it correct is it sufficient for your task and within your computational budget right. So, in computer graphics people struggle with this for a very long time then they design GPUs are there going to be audio processing units that are going to be handling exactly the most uh, important acoustic aspects or is it going to turn out that it does not have to be so high fidelity as it was for the visual case. So, that specialized processing units are not needed right how far do we have to go 